let's begin. So the first thing is like, yeah, I gotta tell you this because um, we're gonna talk a little bit spicy things here. So since I work for the company, I just don't wanna say like anything that I'm saying here is, um, you know, any kind of financial advice or anything. Um, also, um, a little bit about, you know, why, I wanna say this, Ooh. sorry. Sorry about that. So, um, myself, my name is Matt. I'm just an Ethereum fan, a developer who's um, more of obsessed with proof of stake of Ethereum design. You know, what men left, why that is important, why we are bringing complexity. It's not really complex, by the way, but it's simple and it's open and it's permissionless and it's verifiable. Um, so a lot of things that we're saying, why ETH proof of stake matters, and it's a road towards much more public verifiability and reusable data and reusable application level. Um, you know, what ETH is today from the proof of work concept and what it would be tomorrow when the merge comes in, you know, when the execution layer and the consensus layer, you know, just join together and what we're gonna see. So it's more about, you know, ETH today is proof of miner in a proof of work miners gets a lot of ETH. There is no accounting like in apart from what you burn like EIP one five five nine. You know this is not going to users. So it's printed money. You know it's going to the miners and it's coming back. But it's not really deflationary. But that's going to change um, when the proof of stake comes because it's going to be going to be the directly to the users and who are the validators. So that's the flip here. How ETH ETH as an asset is a community held asset, which is keeping the network up time all the time. You know, we have settled more than a trillion dollar asset in the last year. So Bitcoin has a lot of value, but it's not settling as much as ETH is settling. So from that perspective, it's a community held asset, it's much more powerful. So from proof of work, all this community uh, network revenues going back to, to, to its, um, you know, um, users, so it is going to be extremely important to see that how this amplification of the growth will happen at the application level, because it is maintained by, you know, self-interest of people who want to deliver value to end users through, you know, their innovative product, not because of you know, holding an asset, per se. So we have better context here, right? So this is a just a bit of a thing what we're gonna talk. We're gonna take the ETH and we're gonna apply this ETH staked in proof of stake in the rollups world. And what's that going to, to bring it to us? You know, is that just the data availability or the security? Or is that going to bring something else that can make rollups successful and they can bring real value to the world, right? So my take is like a staked asset as a safe asset. Um, so everything that we're going to talk from, not from a technical like you know the node, we we can talk about later. We can talk about that, but from the economic impact of the asset transfer and the the network. So a staked asset is like belongs to a 32 ETH validator because it's anyone can run a node with a 32 ETH. You don't really have to have like in you know, a bunch of that. So you can have thousands and thousands of servers syncing the network at the same time. So, and it is securing the network. So staked assets is like what take is, my take is like, um, you know, two class. It's like staked assets as a safe asset from an economic perspective is as a debt, you know. Why? Because it has been held as a debt for a long-term viability of Ethereum and, you know, we can, do that into two way. We have consensus rewards that is paid by doing a validation job today, you know, that's 4.5, whatever it is. And then we have at an individual level, the stakers will get, you know, that reward that's they're happy. But at a social level, that's, you know, the nodes that have a collection of validators. They have the revenues that can collect later tomorrow from the fee and from other constructive, you know, syndication. I wouldn't say MEV, I would love to say that MEV, but that's a very misleading word because 
when you have a programmability, you can basically inject any kind of logic and you can bring constructive markets on top of it as long as it is open. So that is very important. Let's say that, oh, let's keep it simple. What the hell is simplicity? All right, you come to me, I will prove it. How does provers work? Token, 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 right? Nothing else. So you want to pay for tokens or you want to go and say that Ethereum network, you can just get this data from a node and you can do different things with the smart contract architecture. The good thing there, Ethereum deposit contract, go there. And you burn the ETH, you can basically get a deterministic state root. No one can tamper that. It's on Ethereum proof of work. Is that simple? It is. So we can bring simplicity in a different way. So two, two different factors here. People should be able to retrade the value the network is creating. That's very important, right? And it should be tokenized. So how does this work? Because we are creating this very large network of loosely connected, interdependent, independent place. There are interdependency. So we have this kind of common interest to keep things going, but also we have the controlling interest. Let's say, if I don't validate, I get leaked, my validator, right? If I misbehave, my controlling interest in the network will just go down. I can get slashed. If I have more than n number of validators in the network, the slashing quotient goes up. So it's, it's, um, it's a nice balance. There's a lot of things going into it. So you have this kind of common interest and control interest, and also like you know you have a certain level of risk freeness in terms of what you get. You know you don't really have to worry about you know if you run a DAP node or any kind of that you know the packages and you keep your machine open, and if you have a stable internet connection, you're not going to do any malicious behavior. You can get the the inflation rewards very free. It's like kind of a very risk reward. But if you're a very active player, very dynamic, you know, you want to get more and more, you want to get like, I don't know, some kind of a private mimble strategy, transaction ordering, you can optimize that. You know, that's like if you have validator today on an Ethereum, Ethereum will not say that, you know, after two years, come here and run an auction, you give me this much ETH, I'm going to give you another validator. No. Once you have validators, you have forever. So it's a perpetual yield as long as you can keep that up. It's a permissionless world, man. You can make it, you can lose it. You protect yourself, right? But the thing it is, this is getting interesting. If you can connect this layer with redeemability, the asset at stake on a consensus layer can be redeemable on execution layer. We need to connect this. How do we do this? You know, the redemption guarantees. The redemption guarantees bring the, the dynamic trading strategies much more better at application level. So if you have a wrapped ether, you can send it to Uniswap, and then you know that's that's you have that redemption guarantee in a deterministic way. You know, you're not trading WBTC for that. Because the smart contracts knows that. So you need to have that kind of a very direct connection and um, a trustless accounting. So trustless accounting means you don't need anyone to prove that. You don't need any fancy proofs. I'm not against any CK. I worked in a lot of that. Um, I love it. But we shouldn't bring an intermediary between a public network. People should be able to publicly verifiable data. And now we have another guy in between. We have validators. We have all this rollups coming. But they all have to deal with the fee market. We have a priority gas options. We have variable block size. And we're going to have 12 seconds. 12 seconds, 12 seconds, blocks. No more uncles. Oh, they are gone. It's only one block. So what's going to happen? You have a lot of strategies. You have all these kind of abstractions in play. You know, all these 12 seconds, the last two seconds or three seconds will be extremely valuable because you need to be in the block to get that value out. So the gas auction will see that amplification. Right? So the IP fee market, we believe that will actually get better and better if you have this kind of tooling and applications built, you know, truly exploring this, this capability that we built. 
we're not at there. We're just barely starting. So, you know, this is from the block native. They were just showing the sharding comes, you know, forget about the green thing. Um, this, this is a graph. But what I'm saying is like when we have kind of more rollups, things like that, you know, the transaction volume will increase on outside layers. But these outside layers, are they dependent on ETH? That's a question here, right? If they are dependent on ETH, then they are having more common interest that I explained to you to keep the ETH at the bay, right? That's the, that's the key thing, common interest and controlling interest. So people don't want to pay a lot of gas. We understand that. It's dollar. You, know, you don't want to pay like $50 for to buy a coffee or something. So they will definitely go into to cheaper paths, but those cheaper paths also need to be safer. You know, just look at this, the two seconds thing that I mentioned. You can see that it's again from Block Native. NFT drop, right? Uh, today's NFT drop, but tomorrow it could be anything, right? So you have like about 30 minutes. That's about four epochs. That's the thing, you know, how many 32 slots each. That's, um, you know, you know who is going to make a block, a proposer, you know, and a tester. That's how it's getting rewarded. But if you want to be in there, you have to go and get this guy and negotiate with them and get your things inside. And how do we make this all this thing programmable? So that's what we trying to do for the last two years. Um, we've been working on this, and we've done some work. We presented some of the things on 19th, sorry, uh, with our partners. Um, that will be open um, online, so you can watch it later. So our take is like tokenize it, make it available on Ethereum, tokenize the consensus rewards, so that can have this kind of deep liquidity and then you know the dynamic data and tra trading strategies. Tokenize the, the validator revenues that I just mentioned. So that is basically going on the service flow based. So that, that creates a different kind of market and keep this optimal level of Ethereum validators. This is very important because we are going towards very high performance network. We'll get into that in a second. So the steakhouse, we say, it's a name, it's a house of stakers, it's a clubhouse for stakers, whatever you can call. It's just, it's just a smart contract, it's nothing else, right? It's a smart contract suit. We say that 24, at, at the effective balance of ETH, 24 just goes into this kind of um, inflation consensus rewards and eight will give to this kind of service players who are more active, but who want to get this revenues. They will get all the revenue, but they will, they will also become the first line of defense. So the one key thing here to remember is the inventory of the consensus layer, that is a 32, 32, 32, 32, that could be 31, that could be 30, that could be 28, that should reflect automatically on a smart contract or available off-chain. So what we did, there's another thing, I mean, he left, man, he should have stayed here. <laughs> UTXO, right, UTXO. Yes, I agree with that, UTXO is very simple and you get the deterministic state because proof of stakes are very context of state machines. So we bring up with a registry contract structure. Registry contracts are, you know, we build optimistic UTXs on top of account model. So you can have this kind of issuance and tighter issuance model. Once you have that, you know, you know, you have an A tokens and you can get the data from a node. You don't really need to prove it if you can get it from a node. If there's an information in a node that is derived from a consensus, that is kind of certifi certified data, and you can get network propagation much more faster than going through a block. So the registry contracts will allow you to have the asset value locked in, but its live value will be available on off chain. So now we're talking about the high frequency trading, all this kind of scenario can be done. In a naive way to think about this is like, you know, CowSwap does this in, in, a, in a way that the trading, right? You have the solvers, like you, know, you have this locked up capital in, in a smart contracts, but they're not using registry contracts in any way. What I'm saying is the approach. But you can get it if you can agree it. But now all these this guarantees are coming from the registry contracts, but you only take certain kind of data into the registry that have a deterministic guarantees, right? That is being approved and you know, synced and kept by the, the nodes in the, in the consensus layer. So let's look at the roll-up. Roll-ups need base layer. They need 
8th to put that data proof time to time, less data. So rollups of you know obviously need a lot of ETH at their disposal. They rely that for the security. Let it be CK, let it be optimistic, any kind of rollups. Maybe sometimes the side chains can also do that for vanity purpose. You know, we are dependent on Ethereum, but we can also not to be dependent on Ethereum someday when we become bigger, right? So a bundle that we big, we are Ethereum fanboys. Good. So this would be, you know, the IP559 market and the rollups, but the validators are there same, and they will be like watching. So in general, what's going to happen is when all these things are tokenized, the values are tokenized, it's tradable, and it's available, you know, then these kind of meta markets can emerge off-chain, right? And how do you basically negotiate in between the block times where you can go? You can have a slow tokens at the, 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 the service slow tokens that we just discussed. Um, and if they can you know, if they can represent the fee revenues that are actually going into the to the execution layer. We have some talks about PBS, which is not there. Um, I'm not really following that the latest proposal, but you can basically create that kind of like proposal builder separations and everything here. And you can, you know, people who invested or I would say put the put the put the ETH don't really have to worry about. It. They can lease that the validator rights to to people who want to play with it, and they can they can take the um, you know the, a piece of revenue. But end of the day, it's all more and more and more. It will get injected. It will create an endogenous market. So if you have, you know, we're sucking a lot of fiat into to crypto, right? So it should create about 6 to $7 worth of value. So here what we're trying to do is like, you know, playing this inelastic market hypothesis in the, at the ma macro level, you can see this kind of microelasticity at the validator level. But if you take a shared validator, it's like at a macro level, it is inelastic in the long term, right? Because you can, you know, you can substitute that. Not every, not every blocks are same. Not every epochs are same. Not every validator balance are same. So it gets, it gets amortized. But if you can reuse that, then you can expand it. So we're going from a security thing to a base yield, right? Look at the L2s today, it's about five, six billion. I mean, it's gonna be exponentially large. So, but this six billion is nothing because if you look at all the rollups, same dabs, mostly likely, and all the rollups have it. Multi chain strategy. It's good to bootstrap, but we would love to see rollups more impactful, more purpose driven, more focused. If they want to get that, they want to bootstrap it. So at the time, you know, you know, we have money market too. You have money market? Yes. I have an NFT market too. Yes. The same thing in a plug and play. But this is how we begin. But going forward, what could be? We should bring a network that can provide real. This is a use case, right? So I'm not saying this is the, any kind of um, thesis here. But let's look at the, what the best impactful way that we can do it is like, if we can bring the financial inclusion, the rollups would be a very good way because they're cheaper, they're faster. If they have some base yield, what they're going to do is like they can bring a lot of people. They can have this kind of last mile user onboarding on ramp. The toolings will come, but the the yield should be there. So if you look at the fintech, you know, you say that the the largest operation of the 73 percent. I think it will be different. The current data is a little bit about a year back, but 73 percent is account opening. People want to get into digital because it's easier. So the question here is, everyone says it's going to be ramping up, 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 up. Why do we need a physical ledger in a digital world where people want to come in? A digital world could be fair and open, but are we good enough to beat them at their own game? That's the question here, right? So what if we can? So this is just a representation. Don't take it for granted. We're just, just exploring. We're just exploring here. So if we have like about 7% on a, um, a dollar rate can stem from this kind of uh, two variants of I said, consensus rewards and the service flow. You know, rollups can rollups need the block space. They want the ETH. They can incentivize it. We're already seeing it, how the people are incentivizing to more liquidity into it. They can reuse that. They can repackage it. So you can actually have this kind of a, a mix, you know, um, in, 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 in um 
In the real world, that we have the balance one mechanism, but here it is like you know risk free, like a DE that's just going up because it's a consensus reward. As long as it's there, it happens. But the other one is dynamic; it's more risk proven, so you can have this kind of bundle. But there is no the other unit of account is like you can basically keep a debt tracked, so, so that you have this kind of indexes in the today's world. But this will be available for anyone, and you're basically tracking the proof of stake validator rates, and you can verify it on the fly from the nodes, and you can get all this information is there. Um, you know, you can keep that going. So with the, with the registry contracts, you can basically use this and just um, use a hash for you know, account opening, and then you can connect it to an account. Um, not going in details into how you can do it, but you can definitely do it. Um, I'll show you. So l we ran some simulation. If we kind of do like a 7% target rate in a dollar, people can just put that money and that will be reused to put into, to, into, into staking and will be re that stake that will be tokenized will get used to into all the rollups. So this is like a strategy, right? The dynamic trading strategy is plain. Rollups are want to have this kind of longer block lease, so block spaces. So they want to have like you know people to be engaged and keep their there and they reuse it for their application. So you can see that very unmaintained, nothing dump. You know keep that money and just keep it going. No one is in incentivized to keep that up. Still it is up. You can see the the red thing is going down. It's barely like in you know, a huge hit. Still less than ten, but you can. You can, you can track it, the liquidation will be much lesser, and you can also ha kind of have a drip-based liquidation like the leakage that we have in, in validators. But what if, we, what if someone incentivizes it to keep that, right? So if there is someone is incentivized to get this ETH bundled over there, because it's a very scarce asset. You don't get more than ETH 120 million. So ETH is one of the second largest trading pair. Um, so obviously people want it, and as we grow, as more application using it, they want to do it. If it is being uh, incentivized to keep it, if people are interested in it, that's what we're saying. Obviously, they're interested. So we can keep it at bow, you know, 1.5% collateralized, you know, 150% collateralized. So we are talking about a savings account which is open for universally on a, everyone have an internet connection without going through any Ponzi's, but that is getting reused. That you know, the money is getting reused, so someone is actually doing it. So what you can do today, that's a question, right? All these things, what he said, fantasy or ecstasy, I don't know. You know, he's saying fantasy. You cannot do it today. We can, you know, do it in long term. ETH just works today. That's why it matters. In the long term, you want to do it, we are all dead. I didn't say that. Milton Keynes said that. So let's work on something what we can do today. We've been doing something um, around in this line. So we have shipped um, you know, a registry contracts um, and in a Gorily. You can go and play with it. There are SDKs. You can create money markets and things. Everything just, just playing around with the stake deal. That's all what I'm saying. What are the primitives that you want to do? You can do it. Um, we've been open sourcing the code. It is available. But we're waiting for more and more formal verification you know, to come out on the formal modeling, how this is working without an oracle, this is a mechanism designed how we can correlate the data in a public verifiability from the node, and we can, you know, we can, we can do this in a, in a better way, we can build a better world together. So go there, you can have all this information, but catch us, we'll be ha happy to help you. Um, yeah, so you can do it today, you don't really have to fantasize anything for tomorrow. That's, um, you know, these are the papers, I have to say that because uh, people done an amazing job. That's all I have. If you're ready for sound money, ultrasound money, let's fucking go. <laughs> That's it. Any questions? Sounds everyone understood. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm curious how you view, like, uh, there was a talk earlier. Uh, there was a talk earlier about minimum viable issuance uh, mm -hmm. around POS, and I'm curious how you see the the risk of like the tokenized uh, state ETH, the returns of that versus uh, the risk that that gives you when like the idea is under minimum viable issuance, you actually like the deflation is actually like still giving you a value up, right? Yeah. So it is very important. So this is the last point, the counter cyclical, right? So. 
the point of the ETH mechanism is you can see how the ETH consensus rewards are going from you know more and more ETH stake that gets lesser and lesser, right? So you have this kind of consensus rewards coming. That that's what I said. You have two kind of revenue streams when the proof of stake comes in. The service flow that you can optimize it. You can play with the transaction ordering. You know some of the times the liquidation has to go. You know you can you know any any kind of big protocols can plug into some RPC endpoint and say like, you know, these are the slow token holders, I wanna get through the safe path, I'm ready to give incentivize one my token. So these are outside of it, right? So there's a lot of other elements come into play. For the ETH issuance, it's very important because it is, it is already counter-cyclical, right? It, the behavior comes in when someone actually misbehave to certain more than threshold, the, the, the slashing quotient goes up. So it is intervening, but it is programmable. So all the things that you see in the interventions are there, right? So it's not really like, you know, in proof of work, you're not paying anything, right? The burn fee is there, but in proof of stake, it's deflationary by default because the, the rewards are going back to the users. With a simple computer, you can basically do that, right? You know, you can, you can be an auto operator. So it's paying to its users. It's getting to more and more and more hands. We're doing that. We're basically going that from, you know, uh, like, I don't know, maybe million holders by ETH to 200 million holders of ETH, it is better. So, and also, you know, whatever the staked asset, having this kind of leakage, if your uptime is lesser, leakage. And also when we go for super majority, that's very interesting because when we will have a block deterministic guarantees, everyone wants to have 32 ETH. Because the proposer, the, the builder, need that the priority is there. If you have 32, that's you have the priority, right? You know who is going to build it. So there's a lot of things that's been baked into. You know, we got to read the specification. It's amazing. Proof of stake, the beacon chain specification is, is going to be the new Bible, man. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's a really good question here. Yeah, issuance is very programmable, and it's, it's, um, uh, it's very resilient, in my opinion, yeah, compared to any other proof of stake design. Any other question? Yep. Hi, so I, I saw you were talking a lot about like, having tokenized stake teeth, and then you yeah. want to tokenize the yield, and not just tokenize the yield of stake teeth, but you want to you want to split the tokenization into uh, one part is just like the the validator set rewards, right, and then the other part is was it like MEV or, or or like the tips? So I will just simplify that when I say. Tokenization is like, and I said, consensus rewards and the service flow. Okay, That's yeah, what yeah. we see, right? Consensus rewards are the one that has been paid by the chain, right, after the validation. She gives to a certain, a large portion of users. And small portion of users are very the dynamic players. So if you look at the synthetic entity model in the, in the economics, right, you take a sampling model, right? It's a group and group, right? So the nodes are the one who is running. Not everyone is going to run a node. So you have like 10 okay, or 100 yeah. validators in that. So nodes are the one who is actively participating in this kind of uh, uh, proposing blocks and things like that, right? You have always this entry point, right? When, when this. So the service flow is more driven by them. So what we think is the yield, the staked ETH yield is not only the consensus rewards. It also includes yeah. the transaction order and optimization. I wouldn't call it an MEV. It's not extraction. It's like you know, more of a resource allocation strategy. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, you, you're talking about like having tokenized stake teeth. Yeah. So obviously there are like competitors, right? There's like Lido and Rocketpool, and they already have like stake teeth and liquidity for that. So yeah, I'm just so trying I to wanna, see where this all fits into the No, picture. I want to draw a line there. So we are yeah, not yeah, a, so. we are not a liquid staking provider. We are not right, anything yeah. related to that. We are just a, we just only deploy the smart contract, so you can have registry of the staked ETH that is not available today. So you know, staked the consensus layer data to be propagated for the execution layer. So everything. So we just basically expand the same specification in the smart contracts and build a new smart contract architecture so anyone can do it. So it's not a synthetic, by the way. So basically, okay. just keep that dual factory registry. Who owns what? So at any so given so point. So if I want to participate in this, I still need to like have my own node with 32 ETH and then I can set you don't really need an I'm going to use this smart contract to sort of tokenize that. 
Yeah, so you don't really need a note. You can basically go to joinsteakhouse.com. You have Gorleith, and it just gives you faster things like you can just play with it. 60 seconds, you can have, you can get steak if you have 32 ETH as a first layer in a player. Yeah, and if you don't really have 32 ETH, if you don't really have 32 ETH, you just get a D ETH from Uniswap or elsewhere, but your D ETH has a direct atomic dependency to a validator and a BLS key, and you can see it. So um, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, see here. So this is basically, right? Uh, this is basically graph, right? This is this is an execution layer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you see here? Okay. So, so number of register validators. I'm just pulling the data from the consensus layer prior to Gorley, by the way, right? So you can see that how many validators been registered is 141. You, they put the money into, to, to, you know, they have the validators going on, but not everyone has minted this DETH and slow tokens on consensus, you know, the execution layer. You can see 111, right? It's all fetching the data from a node, right? But we have a lot of problems because not many toolings out there. The nodes are not providing all this kind of a test net and things like that. So we have to do a lot of heavy lifting. You can also see how many groups of validators has been formed called stakehouses. And they all represent as a tickers now. They can, ha they can have like in a tokenized tickers. This is like a, a grouping and grouping and grouping. But end of the day, all the deeds are aggregate fungible. It's just like, you know, cash, like, you know, just, but the registry keeps in between which is the validator has been issued and coming back. So that's the key thing. So it's just in propagation of the data from the consensus layer. So, so does that mean the, the stake teeth from like one node is not is, is not fungible with state teeth from another node. Like you couldn't just put it all in like a liquidity pool. You can, with teeth. this you can, that's what okay. we did. So we implemented this economic protocol on top of the logic to make sure the fungibility is there. So the reusability is there. You okay. can also take a DE from, so this is a- So there's like a a, there must be a bunch of rules for like, oh, if there's some slashing going on, like who yeah, actually yeah, yeah, takes yeah, the yeah. hit. That's, and, and, yeah. and, and that's what we, we were like you know, testing. Okay. That's why I this see. is a very huge tooling database and formal verification is happening. You know, all these equations are playing very well, the mechanism designs are very good. It's like Uniswap, but it's for stake deed. It's a right, public right. benefit. See, yeah. It's a public benefit infrastructure, so anyone can do anything with that. But remember this, this is stake the asset in consensus layer today is available in execution. So you can have the same token, the same same way the registry. We, okay, Alpha Lake, sorry guys. Um, <laughs> the gateways are coming in two, two months. That's also going to be in sandbox. So you can basically take the yield from eth Ethereum to rollups. And it's not sustained. And you can have this kind of, so by default, GETH is 25% extra yield because it's 24 ETH, right? Getting 32 ETH worth of yield. So it's better. So you can have ETH deliver with yield to rollups. So that's a base yield. If you want to do any kind of applications, you want to give a kit to make a money market, you don't really need to go and lending and borrowing. You have that kind of base yield delivered to you on a platter. So this is why we're saying there's a reusability. You want to get this reusability, that's the flywheel kicking in. So we want to reuse ETH at work. Make sense? Yeah. It's just smart contracts, nothing else. We're not doing anything else. Like, this is all done natively instead of yeah. like relying yeah. on a liquidity pool. Basically. Yeah, 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 nothing, nothing there. <laughs> cool. Awesome, thank you, Matt. No problem. Thank you for having me. <laughs>